thanks everybody for joining and uh thanks anurag and team for uh having me come in and you know talk about some of the things that uh we've done on the open cert side of the house with the open source community um now just a quick thing about me i'm a principal analytics specialist solutions architect i do open search all day long not only on aws but also on self-managed you know deploying things on containers deploying things on ec2 or other vms out there so that customers can have a great experience. One of the things that's uh, really interesting is that, uh, you know, using FluentBit, it is part of the architectures that I talk about with my customers. And uh, what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and drop into a couple items here and we'll talk about the benefits and whatnot. But let's really quick go through the agenda and um, give everybody some clarity as to what we're accomplished today. So first of all, we're gonna talk a bit about FluentBit and the open search project. Next, we're going to talk about why FluentBit works well with OpenSearch. The next, we're going to put it all together. So I do have a sample application that is part of one of our labs that we run for customer events, and it's built on top of Kubernetes. And what I have is a sample Movie Geeks database that I'm going to have all of you click on. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set up FluentBit to monitor those logs and we're going to visualize those in open search dashboards. So um, we'll show you what that arc, well, what a minimal architecture looks like, and how we're going to make this happen for this particular uh, webinar. And then after that, we're going to do the demo, and we're going to show fluent bit in action with open search. And finally, we're going to open the questions with you know for myself and, and Anurag. So with that, I'll just go ahead and turn you know it over to Anurag, so he can talk a little bit about fluent bit. And, you know, Anurag, just go ahead and prompt me since I do have control of the deck. Sure, sure. Thank you for, for doing that. Well, you know, FluentBit and, and OpenSearch have been a uh, a great partnership uh, be between the two open source communities, both Apache 2. And one thing that's been really great is they've both been highly community driven. Uh, when we look at what features we want with FluentBit uh, and, and we look at the, the OpenSearch community and how they're building features, very much a community stands, very much a, a way on how do we make sure that folks who are joining webinars like these, who are filing issues on GitHub, who are contributing code, uh, all have a, a way to, to, to be uh, accounted for. Um, so from a FluentBit side, if we just go back in, in time a little bit, it's very much a community-driven open source project, uh, really built uh, back in the era of IoT devices. So. In 2015, this idea of how do we make something super lightweight, can collect a lot of data, route it, uh, and paired with the other project, uh, FluentD. Um, so both of these projects, part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, both of them vendor agnostic. And over time, we found that lightweight, high performance, built for embedded Linux works excellent for containers, works excellent for cloud environments, uh, and is something that we continue to, to build. and. Uh, invest very, very heavily in. And so with that, you know, if the next bullet, please. Really, we've, we've been working very, very hard to make sure it works uh, exceedingly well with uh, a bunch of different backends, uh, as well as data types, right? You have Prometheus, you have OpenTelemetry, you have Kafka, uh, you have things like you want to pull metadata from your cloud provider, making sure that we're really, really extensible with a very powerful open source Apache 2 core. Uh, and that's that's the the mantra we follow at at the, the fluid projects, making sure we're extensible, open source, community driven, uh, and and are able to help solve a lot of the challenges that the the community has. Okay, for all right. Well, so um, you know, everybody asks me a lot about the open search project, and it's something that you know is near and dear to AWS. But I want to stress that the open search project is community driven. Now, while AWS is a contributor, um, we are not the owners of the project. So, you know, when we look at the project at itself, it's open sourced, which means that everybody here that's on this webinar can you know, commit to the project. They can add their views, their ideas, build plugins, help further accelerate that project so it's truly open source. So it is underneath the Apache 2 license, which means that you can fork it. You can do things that you want for your company to make you successful. You can turn it into a hybrid search engine and do many of the things that you see that the community is doing with the project. Now, just a little background. A while back, we did fork this project because of licensing change. And that licensing change 
you know, meant that right around Elasticsearch 7.10.2 and Kibana, we had to fork that so we could be on the Apache 2.0 license for our particular, uh, you know, activities that we're doing at AWS. But still means this project carries forward and we're fully invested in ensuring that the project is successful, not only with the open source community, but also with our customers that use it on AWS. So what you will find is that it's basically a branding change. The code base, while it still continues to develop, you know, is still very, very fundamental and similar to how Elasticsearch and Kamana do operate. But there are a lot of differences that you're going to see. And as we go through this series a bit more, hopefully some of these follow-on webinars that Anurag and myself and others uh, on my team will be helping with, you'll be able to realize the value of both of the products, not only Fluent Bit, but also OpenSearch. So again, the project consists of a, a, a search uh, engine, which is called OpenSearch. And it also has a visualization layer, which is called OpenSearch dashboards. Now, we do have a uh, ETL solution, which is called Data Prepper, but we don't consider ourselves a log collector with this particular solution. We use it for preparing data. It's really um, you know, part of the whole open telemetry system or the whole open telemetry framework where you have logs, metric, and traces, and Data Prepper was meant to assemble traces, but we also do some log processing also as part of the observability uh, you know, pyramid. So in the end, when you use it with uh, FluentBit, it is a value add because it does some additional things that you know, from the FluentBit side of the house, it's not on their roadmap, and it's more uh, akin to the stuff that we do with OpenSearch. So in the end, you'll see, is that will enable you to easily ingest, secure, search, aggregate, view, and analyze you know, data that's provided by your logs, metrics, and traces. Now, again, there's rich plugins for observability anomaly detection. Generative AI, everybody hears about that. We do have you know, some built-in features on the search side of the house, security analytics, and many more plugins. And we intend on, in the project, uh, you know, further developing those ideas. And hopefully some of you that are, are watching this webinar can also help commit to that, not only to the open search project, but also on the fluent bit side of the house, because you can commit to that project also, which is really great. Um, so, you know, what do open search dashboards or how do open search dashboards provide value? Now, when we look at things, open search and open search dashboards aren't a log collector. And so when you look at things, when the log data comes in from a perspective, when you're running your business, it provides little value unless you have tools to make sense of it. And as you can see, this is output data that's coming from, you know, parsing particular things. And, you know, the, the data that gets prepared by FluentBit comes in this sort of JSON format. Now, for you and I that go looking through things in Discover Pane, most of us are well of our data structures. But if you take somebody else that comes new to your business and you tell them to find an issue, they're going to go, what? What am I doing here? I don't understand. How can I get started? Well, logs contain various fields. And these fields are important for helping you drive decision making. But when you have to look through millions of entries of log lines, it's trying to see the forest through the trees. And so, you know, if you can get this data in a format where you can quantify error rates, understand trends, or make informed decisions, guess what? That's when visualizations come in because open search dashboards will query the open source, the open search engine for the data that was brought to it through FluentBit, and it queries the APIs for those specific fields, and it assembles it into valuable insights that help you reach your SLAs and SLOs or whatever other business goals that you have based on the data that's in OpenSearch. So why do we use FluentBit with OpenSearch? What's the compelling thing? You'll say there's plenty of other log collectors out there. There's plenty of other ETO tools. I can write my own code. Well, exactly. You're writing your own code, but maybe the other tools aren't actually as much of an integration. Now you will see that there is now an OpenSearch output plugin um, as part of the package. And, you know, Anurag and his team work diligently to get that in place. So when you look at the different variants of, say, OpenSearch and Elasticsearch, you have a purpose-built plugin that is structured for the interfaces for that engine. So when we look at it, FluentBit doesn't have a visualization layer. It's primarily, from the way I see it, 
a data collector, a transformer, an event router for ingestion activities, and it prepares that data for consumption. Now, Open Search works, works well for integrating with that, and apologies, I forgot to accept some changes on some edits, so you will see some red lines in there. My bad, I thought I did accept the changes, but in the end, it works well with ingesting and storing the data, but Open Search itself is not a visualization tool. So we can get it prepared, we can make it searchable, but then Open Search dashboards is then the thing that makes the visualizations occur over this pipeline of data. And so in the end, when I look at that, the combination of these three fundamental tools in its basic sense is what constitutes observability. And that means being able to view your data and make sense of it and make informed business decisions. Now, how do we put this all together? And when we look at it, um, you know, there is a very basic pattern that we have here. And when we look at it, you install FluentBit on your log host. Now, FluentBit is configuration driven. You pull the, the, the package from either it's built into a container. If you're on a VM and you're on a Linux platform, you're downloading a package and you're installing it. You're, you're running it as a daemon or an agent. If you're on a Windows box, you're downloading an executable and you're running it as an agent process. But in the end, Fluent Bit is going to be configured through configuration to read the logs that are on your host. And it can read other things and it does have other connectors, but that's for a later uh, you know, uh, event. Now, you have Open Search. Now, Open Search, again, stores that data and it stores it on disk, but it actually takes the format that comes from Fluent Bit and it prepares it in a searchable binary format. We call this a BM25 algorithm. It's an inverted index. I won't go into the details. Even for me, there's a lot of detail there and it's a quite a long discussion, but all you have to know is that the data comes in a JSON format, it's indexed, it's stored on disk and it's made searchable. So usually what we do is we have a port that's open on OpenSearch for the bulk API or for the API plat the suite. And Fluent Bit and the output plugin for OpenSearch uses that and through configuration, it will talk to the port. Now you can change this port, you aren't stuck to it, it's one of the defaults. And it will do all the work of preparing the data and calling the bulk API, which if any of you have written your own code, you understand that you have to do back off retries. There's exponential algorithms. You have to worry about the buffering. You have to worry about how do I get this data in and FluentBit takes care of all that for you. Now, once this data and your configuration is moving things into open search, then we have a browser now in the typical open search, open source deployment port 5601 is what open search dashboards is configured for. So port 5601 is what you'll use to uh, interface with the data on open search. And usually it's a browser based session in open search dashboards and facilitates that whole activity. Now you're going to say, I want to see how this all works. So what I have now is you know, a similar architecture, but I have a few other containers that have the open search thing and there's an application in there. So if you can go to tinyurl.com and look for FBOS, that's Fluent Bit Open Search Webinar, all one word, lowercase, or you can scan the QR code, you should be able to see a, um, a screen in here. And let me just go ahead and pull um, my tab up on it. And uh, let's go down to the one down here. And you should see something that says IMDB um, uh, Open Search Demo. And so what we have is a variety of IMDB uh, uh, entries in here. It's about 5,000 movies that you can search. Um, you should see after that tiny URL expands something that says K8s, which is the Kubernetes deployment of this particular application. It's, uh, I believe it's written in React and it, and it interfaces with the APIs against the search engine. And what it does, if I go in here and search for something like wine, I'll see bottle shock, blood and wine. If I search something like sports, um, I should see anything that's related to sports. And it tells me that I had seven results and you can scroll down and look at these things. Um, and you can also see across these result sets that I have some facets. I have all the directors that were associated with these movies and the count of the movies that were participants on, also the actors and the genre. And so, um, if you do select this here, just select a template and select IMDB data, 
Um, it should work across both, but start entering, you know, a single search term in there. This is a very, very basic application. It's not all the well, the, the bells and whistles that you have with a typical search application, but you can start things and, you know, look for something like Iron Man, right? Um, and if you spell it wrong, you won't pick it up because those terms aren't exact and I have exact matches in there. But Iron will show me Iron Man or any things that have uh, in the description of the movie Iron. So what will happen is that all of this activity is getting captured in logs. And now with the logs, effectively, they're spilling onto the container and there is a, a bit of a file system in there. And right now I have uh, a fluent bit deployed, but it's going to standard out. So let's just go ahead and jump in and take a look at the containers that are running behind the scenes. Now, um, I, you know, given that I'm an AWS person, I usually rely on the power of, you know, the, the stuff that gets stood up for me. And I am using EKS, which is a managed Kubernetes uh, system. And I am using System Manager, which means I don't have to SSH in a thing. It's very secure. So I do have something called an open search lab, lab instance. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to jump into it. And I am going to connect with that. And I'm going to start a terminal session. Usually, you all will SSH into it or use whatever toolings will go in there. Um, I like to use a little bit of a, a, an easier path and a traceable path. But in here, we can go through our, our, our standard example. So one of the typical things that people use is um, kube control or CTL. And um, there's a few command sets in here. And usually, I always have these prepared off to the side. But there's one called get pods. And so this will tell me all of the pods that are running. Now, inside of this, we do have some scripts that help us prepare and deploy. Kubernetes is a great environment for defining your containers and preparing the configurations for them. And in this case, I see that I have um, MovieGeek, which is a sidecar. It's not only running the Fluent Bit stuff, but it's also capturing the logs for my movie stuff, and it's uh, running the movie instance. I also have my open search dashboards. It's running on a separate container. And I have a cluster master one, cluster master two, cluster master three. It's actually data nodes and other functionality, but it constitutes a cluster. Now, if I want to go ahead and look at the configurations that I have in here, I can run through my uh, history and um, look at some of the, well, looks like I don't have enough history in here. Let me run back to my quick command set. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at um, how the configuration's currently deployed. And in this case, um, we're going to look at the um, configuration, and uh, I'm going to look at the config map, config map command, and I'll use less instead on here. And we grab this, and what the config map is, it has all the entries that I need well, to um, look at what my current configuration is. So I'll go ahead and paste this in here, and I'll do less on that. Hold on a second. I have a new laptop and a new keyboard, so I will be doing typos here. Oh, we'll get, and while you're doing that, Kevin, I saw one question. Um, I think, folks, you might need to select the template and the index, um, and and then I it, it should be able to to search after after that, uh, just in case you're running into some some problems there. But uh... yeah, so um, I'll just go back to that one screen. And thanks for pointing that out, Anurag. Um, let's just go back into it. I just need to move the uh, stuff up top around here and um, all over here. Um, so if I look at the very top, and let me just slide the, the controls here up. Um, underneath template, just leave it empty. And underneath index, select IMDB data. It's buried in here, um, unfortunately. Let me just uh, make this a little bit bigger so people can see. So in here, um, we have a simple search. Um, we have IMDB data. Uh, both of them should give me results. Um, and uh, in the end, you know, you'll be able to, you know, based on whatever terms you put in here, um, you should see some stuff. So let us know if you're not getting this. You should see a URL up here that you know basically has case default ingress some, you know, numbers in US East 1, ELB, Amazon.com. So um, we're getting some confirmation it's it's working again. So that's good. <laughs> outstanding. Yeah, they are small containers. Hopefully I don't have stack traces going left and right. But, you know, I think for the purpose of this demo, it should survive. 
Um, I did not build this for scale. Um, you know, well, more... good. It's it's fun. This is one of our first uh, uh, full live uh, live audience participation in the webinar. So I, it's this is fun. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, and and so as I'm talking, everybody click around because what we're going to do is once we get the index flowing here, um, we'll be able to you know, and after I share the config and change the config and restart the container, um, you know, I'll have everybody start blasting into their searches. Um, but in the end, you know, what I do is I give uh, inside of the uh, config um, stuff, I, I do give it a name and whatnot. But the important pieces that you want are we define a configuration. This case is called fluentbit.conf. Now I'm, I'm I'm bringing in other inputs and other outputs, and we'll take a look at those here in a bit. But at the highest level, there are a bunch of configuration parameters inside of fluentbit. One's going to be service, one's going to be input, one's going to be output, and one's going to be parsers. Those are the the typical ones that I use. Now, in the service, there's a command for flush. All flush is going to say, as my buffer fills up, dump this out to whatever my output is. If I look at my output, the output is standard out. So that is my output standard out configuration. Now, in the future, we're going to have a a, a movie geek. Uh, I mean, we're going to have an output to open search, and I'll I'll run you through that in a second. But right now, what I'm doing is I'm using the tail on the input plugin side. I have a tag of Golang. This is so that we can do some other things when we start parsing the data out and looking at what index it's going to go to. Um, but we determine the path, and we also have a, a, a little database. Usually, this is going to hold some position information. As you're adding data, it needs to know how to consume the data. And usually, it is in a buffer. The buffer could be on disk, it could be on memory. And there's a concept of chunks, and those chunks are basically processed and pushed. The whole idea is I like to move my stuff pretty quick. Um, but you give it a limit. You tell what parser you're going to use so it knows to take this raw data and convert it into JSON. So it will interpret the data, and it would be, in my case, space delimited. And it's going to break those out into individual fields, and it's going to go ahead and prepare that so it can be logged. Now, in the end, you have the output section. Right now, I'm going to stand it out, and I'm saying match everything. Now, I could say just match you know, my tag for Golang or maybe other inputs that I have in here because you're not prohibited from having multiple inputs and you're not prohibited also to writing to multiple destinations on the output. But in the end, I have a parser and I give it a name, I do the format and that, that name, the JSON here for the parser, this little tag refers to the name that you give it. So these two have to match. So in the end, I give it a time key. Now, why is a time key important? For all time series data, open search for log analytics needs to understand order and event. As events are emitted, we put a timestamp on it, and that's added to the log so we can do nice little graphs and visualizations. Uh, so uh, in there, I say keep time field on, and I have other configuration items. Now, that's what it looks like right now. And so escape, colon, view, bang, all right. And um, so uh, I have similar configurations for the rest of this. We don't need to go into it. Um, if we look at how an open search cluster is, and I actually might just go into it a real quick second, I'm basically these config maps are defining the configurations that are going to drive standing up these individual instances. And so if I look at how I did the open search side of the house, and let me just go ahead and get in here and do a control V, I have to do a paste inside of this tool. I'm not using a proper um, SSH thing. So let's paste it. And if I look at this, I'm going to see very different entries. But in the end, uh, did I grab the right information? Hold on a second. And this is what's the great thing about these demos. Uh, let me grab this one right here uh, and grab map. I might have a control character somewhere in there. Always a possibility. Uh, go ahead and paste this and do it. Let's go ahead and drive that. And hold on a second. The demo gods. All right. <laughs> um, let me just grab one more here and grab this and do the copy. Let's roll this up. I think I might have a control character that I'm not seeing. Let me just go ahead and push that in and do the paste. Um, we won't dwell too long on this. If I can't get this to show, we'll just move on. And okay. 
anyhow, um, we'll add, add as an action item to be figure out why this is not showing up. But um, in the end, let's let me go back to my list of commands. Now, um, what what I have right now is um, you know a uh, I, I want to look at the log. So what I can do here is I'm going to look at the movie geek logs that I have in here, and um, take a look at the paste this here, and take a look at um, what is being emitted. And we might need to switch the name to, I think, because it's a different pod name. The, oh, the, yeah. You know, let me make you ID. <laughs> oh, yeah. You got it. You got it. This is what happens when you prepare and you make some last minute changes and you don't update your notes. Let me just grab this real quick. And let's grab the pod here. And let's copy that. And let's paste this in here. And here we go. And run to the end. All right. So um, in the end, you know, um, it's it's waiting for some information. I probably won't see stuff since I'm dumping it to standard out. But in the end, I, I'll be able to go in and look at the logs for the particular things that I'm monitoring. Um, in here, I have, uh, you know, I can look at the fluent bit stuff. Fluent. And these are just the fluent bit logs. Uh, B I T, and this one should emit a bunch of stuff. And um, let's do Q. Let me actually put the list back in there. So as you can see, you know, there's log entries that are coming in um, for my particular process. In this case, you know, it's the startup of the actual container that's uh, running the uh, Fluent Bit stuff. You'll see some errors in there because we basically took a larger process and removed a bunch of things. But in the end, I have logs, and so. What I'm going to do right now is um, I want to capture those logs and push them into open search. So we're going to run a brand new configuration on this. And so um, first of all, I'm going to run into um, the path where my um, details are at. And so uh, CD and then paste. Uh, yeah, just keeping a track on time here. And uh, let me drop this in. And Stash L. So I will see all of my configurations in here, and we'll see that I have you know my config maps, all my configurations, one for standard out, one for the deployment. And so if I look at the um, less uh, M O B I E G E E K tab, um, that should be deployment T P L YAML. I'll see that I have um, a a, a quite a, a few information, a piece of information here on how my my movie geek um, stuff is going to be set up. So you'll see a lot of information where I define the ports for the application. In this case, 8080, 81, 82, and other things like that. Um, I can see where I'm going to do my log path, and this is my configuration or you know fluent bit to pick up this information, and then use some of that data to stand up. Uh, you know, the details for my application itself. And then um, when I go into looking the config map here, and maybe geek dot c o n tab, you know, I can see there's other configuration files in here also. And this is really where I define the, the details um, for my movie geek. Now, this is the configuration that I'm going to deploy. And as we can see, when we go in here, that I still have all the same information in here. My log level is a flush. I'm including some other configurations. The one's going to be the Movie Geek Conf, which has the tail. None of this changes. Um, and then I have my output. Now, what's different about the output here now is I'm no longer logging the standard out. I am now using the output plugin that Alan Rog's team and, and his company have developed. And... I'm basically saying when uh, I'm use a name for open search, which is going to be the, the the particular section for it, um, and this is the plugin that's going to be used. And I'm saying match all of my tags. So in this case, it's a GoLang tag. If I had another tag in here that had GoLang and you know ABC, I could put GoLang ABC. In this case, I'm saying just match everything. So when it goes and processes, it's actually doing that routing. It's it's saying 
everything that you have sent it to open search right now. In this case, I only have one configuration, so only one configuration is ever going to go. Again, the parser doesn't change, the time fields don't change. So let's go ahead and let's flip over this configuration. So, so uh, was go ahead. Say, while, while you're doing that, um, someone had a question if this is going to use the TLS, um, and it is. So this the TLS was on, but TLS verify was off. Um, so you know, just for the, the folks who are asking that, um, yeah, this will this will use TLS. Yep. And so we see the old configuration. And so let's go ahead and, and we've already looked at the config map YAML. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to force a new configuration. And what we're going to do is we're going to burn a container and we're going to stand it right back up again. So in here, let me go ahead and paste this. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm now going to apply this configuration from the old config map to the new one. And so what's going to happen behind the scenes is as it's going to configure, and now my Fluent Bit Sidecar should now have the new configuration. Now, what I'm going to do then is I need to delete the um, the pod, it's uh, the, the the particular pod that's running. And so I'll just do a real quick command. So kube ctl get pods. And so what I want to do is look at the particular pods. In this case, it is a movie geek, um, one that says M4DCQ. And what we're going to do is let me just copy that into memory. I am going to go ahead and I'm going to delete that one. So what we do is we use C-U-B-E-C-T-L space delete P-O-D and I pop the name in. So let's paste that and we're off to the races. Now, what's going to happen is that I, um, for a short time period, now don't have a component that's working. Now, what we're going to do is after that setup, I need to go ahead and just to ensure that my config is going to be what I want it to be. So we're going to do one more time. I'm going to run in and make sure that that actually got changed. And so just verify before I do my final swap. And I should see now my open search stuff. Now, I do have replacement variables in here. What's going to happen is that my environment variables that I when I stood up the, the container fleet itself, these are variables that's going to pull from the environment variables that you have. So you can actually configure in your Kubernetes deployment the things that can spill down into your individual multiple containers. So these will get replaced. Um, I don't usually put these in a wild. Obviously, uh, you know, we're using HTTP user and password on the open search side of the house. You can actually use SIG before request signing. You can also apply search and whatnot. It's a very rudimentary very raw thing and, and, and follow on webinars. We'll get into some more of these sticky details about SIG before and whatnot. But so I'm happy with what I have here. And so what I'm going to do is I am going to go and um, da -da -da, so I can do, simulate the application. So I'm going to start my search ticker. Now, uh, da -da -da, copy. Now, what this does is this generates data. And I'm going to let that run for a bit. And then I am going to um, kick this thing off. And I'm going to paste it. And this should start generating some logs. So I'm going to let that happen for a few seconds here. And I'm going to go ahead and control C this. Now, um, let's go ahead and look at our containers. So kube control C U B E C T L. Get PODS. All right. And so we see that I have a new one that's running out here. So now I should be able to then go into my open search dashboards. So what I'm going to do real quickly, and if there are questions, maybe on or I can take them. I am going to go into my particular deployment and I am going to um, look at my login here. And gonna grab that saved object. So let's go in here. While you're pulling that in, um, a few questions that came up was, hey, I have several pods in my application. Do I have Fluent Bit in each pod? Can I have a centralized Fluent Bit? Uh, this is great. These are like some of the architecture patterns uh, that we'll run into, right? You might have one per uh, pod. It's called like a sidecar pattern. There is a pattern called daemon set where you have one um, on every single node that, that links up to Kubernetes. Uh, so there's a couple of architecture patterns. It's actually uh, a pit, one of the, the ones that we're thinking of in the series for the next one. So common architecture patterns, how do you do things like agents, sidecars, pipelines, 
all of the good stuff there. Uh, so it's a uh, it's great to to have that question come up as it relates to some of the, the future content coming. Uh, and then a couple other questions that came in um, on the uh, Logstash side. Hey, should I use Logstash format? Uh, you know, what should I should I use the other uh, index? And it, you know, just it, it doesn't really um, matter too much. Uh, you know, on on how you might want to to go build that. Um, you have the, both choices, of course. And sometimes I'll, you'll point I'll point users to it uh, for ease of use, ease of transition, something they might have been doing before. And especially on the date side, we can roll into C's um, and and have that going. So uh, a couple of patterns there uh, that are that are always good to to go through. And then some some questions about the certs. Uh, yeah, so if we, TLS on for sure. Uh, and then, you know, putting a TLS verify is going to start to check the uh, certs between Fluent and OpenSearch. And that's where you might want to put some of the advanced settings like cert file, CA file, uh, and, and some of some of that. All right. So um, now once I have my data in, uh, we have to define an index pattern now. My index pattern here, um, basically, uh, and we'll just walk you through this so people understand how to do this. So, when the one of the basic functions in Open Search is the Discover tool. The Discover tool is where you can look at your raw data. You can analyze and look at the structure. You can inspect what it looks like. We can see the JSON document um, and other things along those lines. So. Um, now, uh, in this particular uh, uh, event here, let's just go ahead and go into um, the management console. And so we have a uh, dashboards management. And in here, this is where we define an index pattern. So I'll go ahead and I'll just delete this index pattern, first of all. And I'll go ahead and eliminate that. And we'll delete that. Now, what happens is that when I go to create an index pattern, I'm going to select the index that I want. In this case, it's going to be uh, Movie uh, Geeks. And so on the next step here, um, I'm going to grab a time field in here. You use timestamps so we have time series information. So once you have this, then what's going to happen, it's going to look at the fields and it's going to say, oh, in this case, I have you know a query, query level, a bunch of information that's associated with this log. It defines the fields. It tells you if they're aggregatable, aggregatable and searchable. Um, so things that you're going to want to know are, you know, details around, you know, maybe the query, um, and that can be a keyword and a text. So once you define that, you can actually go and discover. We can grab that pattern, and we can look across the data, and I can look at the last 15 minutes, and I can see that I'm grabbing information in here. So I can see that there's 636 different. Uh, you know, events that are in here. Some of it is talking about um, the logs that I have uh, behind the scenes. And um, I would assume some of my events are in here, but um, let's go ahead and let's look at, you know, some of the, the fields. Now I'm able to look at, you know, these fields and I can go ahead and drill down on into them. And what will happen is if there's any data in these fields, it will, looks like someone's trying to search for Bern Theron, uh, delegating <laughs> centrifugal, uh, yeah, exactly, I love it. Transform, wealthy needs, computerized Gwyneth Little He-Man. <laughs> I love it, I love it. So what we're gonna do here is that some of these logs don't have any information, but let's just go in and let's do a simple visualization on the query itself. So now I have the data, we can use visualizations to look at things. And I'm gonna create a new visualization. In this case, let's go with a heat map. Um, a heat map is, you know, something that actually, you know, what's uh, I actually want to do a tag cloud because this will basically give you a bubble of what people are looking at and it'll rank it by the most important. And so what you're gonna do is we're gonna do a tag size count on it and we're gonna add some buckets. And when I add this bucket, let me just move this out of the way so I can actually see. So um I'm going to do the tags. I'm going to select an aggregation. And I'm going to aggregation on terms. I'm going to select a field. And that field is going to be my query keyword. Keywords are aggregatable. And you know, we noticed that there was some empty stuff in there. And so I can actually 
say show missing values or don't show missing values. And it's just going to lump it in as something called missing. And we're going to update this. Now what's going to happen, we can now see what was the the, the, the most uh, prominent one, well, of course, the log entries that had nothing were missing. But if I say, you know, don't show that missing value, let's just go ahead and show me what people are actually searching for. And I can say, what are the top terms? Um, pardon me. I have, uh, you know, this nice little monitor that is hidden behind something. But I can change this number into what are my 10 top terms? And let's go ahead and update it. So now we're going to see, you know, what's really nice is that we can see that iron, this is because I run this little code generator behind the scenes and I went ahead and stopped it. But this search ticker, all it does is just fire queries. But, you know, these queries don't have these interesting things like ridiculous movie or actual force drowning brat. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, you know, this is uh, I, I love it when we have an audience like this and we can see what people like to search for, because, you know, there's some really cool movie names in here. But in the end, you know, what we'll do here is we'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and save this and I can save this visualization as demo. And now I have a visualization. And as I'm querying more data, what happens is I can run and let's get this into a dashboard. Let me go into a dashboard. Let me create a brand new dashboard and let me add one of those visualizations. So we'll go ahead and add and we'll pull the one that we just grabbed, which is the demo. When we click on that. And now I have a dashboard. Let's go ahead and save this. Yes, I use LastPass. Don't try to hack me. Um, let's go ahead and save this as a demo uh, mo dashboard. So um, you know you can store the time with it, um, which means that the time from now it will use. But I rely on the time inside the dashboards and visualizations. And so now that I have this done and I have my awesome dashboard. You can do things like move these around. You can add other visualizations on top of it. I know we're coming close to time. So I am going to rush this. Apologies. You know, sometimes when the demo gods play with you, you have to work around it. But um, in the end, now I can just go in here and say, go ahead and refresh every 10 or every 10 seconds. And so what will happen is when I click this over the last 15 minutes data or say the last, uh, you know, uh, Let's go, you know, last 30 minutes of data. You can narrow or widen your time uh, uh, frame to look at what was going on. Now, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to update um, to the last 30 minutes, and I'm going to update that information. And I should have my now 10 seconds refresh. And what we'll see is it will continually change. And so if I'm, you know, trying to impress my bosses, I'm going to put a nice little series of visualizations in my, my, my operation center. And, you know, if I have this application or I'm trying to understand what everybody's looking for, or I just scour and robot crawl all this stuff inside of, uh, you know, what Google might have, I can see that the most important terms out of those 10 and their prevalence either is larger or smaller. And every 10 seconds you refresh to give you an idea of what people are looking for. And it looks like, Everyone's looking for open search. And yes, I agree, stop politics. And that's where we start to stop talking about politics. <laughs> but in the end, um, this is a demo. I know we breeze through stuff real quick. Our whole goal here is, you know, um, in a future state is we're going to build on this. And we actually have a lab out there. I won't share it right now, but Anurag does have a lab. I think I forgot to put it in here. Um, we'll share it here uh, real shortly. Um, and it's a really quick thing. It's not as uh, interesting. Oh, I can't say it. it's interesting. It's not as similar as this. It has interesting details where it shows you how to monitor the CPU of an instance. Um, so um, we'll share that here real quick. But um, I'm going to open it up for questions. And I know I did jump through things a lot. And it looks like someone's trying to hack me with some, uh, you know, uh, force a SQL command in there. Um, you know, this is what happens when you expose a public endpoint to, to everybody you know, friends find it before you know it, the hackers come after you. <laughs> but um, questions, everybody.